Today we will discuss the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna said at the end of the previous chapter that the Bhakti Yogi is the topmost Yogi. And so far Krishna has described Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Ashtanga Yoga. Now he will begin to describe Bhakti Yoga. He will describe Bhakti Yoga in great detail. This description of Bhakti Yoga will be over the next six chapters. Now in this chapter, he is continuing his description from the previous chapter. Krishna begins this chapter by saying, Now hear from me, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. So Krishna is now going to speak to Arjuna about himself. This is Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga means primarily to know Krishna. Further Krishna says, I shall now give you the complete knowledge which includes the knowledge of this world and the knowledge of the spirit behind this world. By knowing this, nothing further shall remain for you to know. So this is complete knowledge. Out of many thousands among men, hardly one person may endeavor for perfection. And of those who have achieved perfection, hardly one person may know of the people who have achieved perfection. Hardly one such perfect person may know Krishna in truth. So what is this perfection? It is said, human life is meant for self-realization. That self-realization is described here as perfection. Mostly people are interested in just eating, sleeping, mating and defending. These are bodily demands and people are just busy with meeting the demands of the body. They are not interested in perfection of human life. That means they are not interested in self-realization. What is self-realization? Self-realization means to understand that I am spirit soul. This understanding of oneself as spirit soul is the beginning of self-realization. Complete self-realization means to know who am I, who is Krishna, and what is my relationship with Krishna? Now complete self-realization can be achieved only by practice of Bhakti Yoga. Because Krishna can be known only by Bhakti and by no other means. Therefore Krishna says that even among those who have perfected their life, those who have achieved self-realization, it is very rare to find a person who is self-realized, who knows Krishna in truth. Then Krishna describes uh, his two energies in this world. What are the two energies? The material energy and the spiritual energy. The material energy is described by Krishna as his inferior energy. Why? Because material energy lacks consciousness. So material energy, Krishna says, is made up of eight elements. 
earth water fire air and ether these are the five gross elements and there are three subtle elements mind intelligence and ego hmm? these are the three subtle elements so totally there are eight elements which make up this material energy in this world all the living beings are krishna's superior energy or spiritual energy in this world now both these energies the material energy and the spiritual energy are completely controlled by krishna the living beings are exploiting the material energy and are sustaining the universe the whole universe there are so many activities which are going on these activities are due to the living beings trying to exploit the material energy now krishna explains all created beings have their source in these two energies anything which is created in this world is either belonging to the material energy or to the spiritual energy so therefore krishna says of all that is material and all that is spiritual in this world krishna himself is both the origin and the dissolution so ultimate cause is krishna ultimate source is krishna <clears throat> then krishna declares to arjuna very importantly there is no truth superior to me everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread so next krishna explains how he is present everywhere in this world by his different energies <clears throat> we have heard this phrase god is everywhere now bhagavad gita specifically explains how god is present everywhere especially in this world krishna says he is the taste of water the active principle of water is its sweet taste similarly he says he is the light of the sun and the moon uh, we are dependent on sunshine for all our energy requirements in fact the scriptures explain life is sustained on different planets because of the energy that is coming from sunshine similarly moonshine nourishes all vegetation therefore krishna says he is the light of the sun and the moon he is the omkar in all vedic mantras every mantra begins with om just like you might have heard om namah shivaya you see they are praying to shiva but it begins with Om. Om Shri Ganesha Ya Namaha. Take any Vedic mantra. It begins with Om. So that Om is actually representation of Krishna in all the Vedic mantras. Krishna says he is the sound in ether. It's like a clapped. You hear the clapping. how is that because the sound which is present in ether or space loosely we may say space that is actually a representation of krishna in fact this whole creation began with one sound the sound of om the whole creation creation began like that so krishna is ultimately the sound in ether 
Krishna is the ability in man. So many people have different abilities. What is the source of their ability? It is Krishna only who is giving the ability to every person. Then Krishna further says he is the origin of all fragrance in the earth. Or he is the original fragrance of the earth. He is the heat in fire. Fire is valuable. We use fire because it contains heat. So that heat is representation of Krishna's own energy. Krishna is the life of everything that lives. The life force is actually representation of Krishna. And Krishna is the penance of all tapasvis. Anybody is doing tapasya, the tapashakti is representation of Krishna. Krishna is the original seed of all existences. Anything in existence begins with a seed. So that seed of every existence is representation of Krishna. Krishna is the intelligence of the intelligent people. He is the prowess of all powerful men. That means he is the source of all power. All power comes from Krishna. Krishna is the strength of the strong, devoid of passion and desire. Krishna is sex life which is in accordance with religious principles. Even sex life is representation of Krishna. So, Srila Prabhupada explains, sex life is therefore meant for producing good progeny, Krishna conscious children. So, this verse therefore implies that it is the responsibility of parents to make their children Krishna conscious. That is the implication of Krishna telling he is represented by sex life which is in accordance with religious principles. Finally, Krishna concludes this description about his representation in this world through his energies being spread everywhere. He says, all states of being are existing because of Krishna's energy only. All his energies are spread everywhere throughout the creation. As his energy, Krishna is everything. But at the same time, Krishna is still independent of everything. So, there is simultaneously oneness between Krishna and his energies and there is also difference between Krishna as the Supreme Person, Supreme Lord and his energies. This is the philosophy taught by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Everything in this world is one with God or Krishna and also everything is separate from God. This oneness and difference is inconceivable. Achintya bheda abheda tattva. This is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches us as the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Anyway, Krishna explains, he is in one sense everything, and he is also independent of everything, separate from everything. All material activities that we see everywhere that is going on is conducted by three gunas. You might have heard these names. These three gunas are called Sattva guna, Rajoguna and Tamoguna. Now these three gunas are coming from Krishna. Krishna is the source of these gunas. But Krishna is not affected by these three gunas. 
even though it looks like Krishna is also, uh, when he comes to this world, when he incarnates, looks like he is under these gunas, but actually he is completely aloof from these three gunas. Further, Krishna says, deluded by these three gunas, the whole world does not know Krishna. Everybody who is taking birth in this world is actually influenced by these three gunas. And therefore, due to the influence of these gunas, everyone is in ignorance about Krishna. Actually, Krishna is above the gunas and he is also inexhaustible. These gunas actually are limiting everyone. Even though Krishna comes to this world sometimes, he incarnates, he is not limited by these gunas, he is not affected by the gunas. Uh, he always is having unlimited powers, unlimited energy, unlimited everything. So in that sense, he is inexhaustible. The material energy which consists of these three gunas, the Sattva guna, Rajoguna and Tamoguna, is described by Krishna as his divine energy. It is his divine energy. Why is it described by Krishna as his divine energy? Because this energy, even though it is described by Krishna earlier as inferior energy because it lacks consciousness, but still due to its connection with Krishna as his energy, it is described as his divine energy. And this material energy is very difficult to overcome for all the living beings in this world. But those who surrender to Krishna, only they can easily cross over this material energy beyond the gunas. They can come out of the influence of the gunas by only one method, that is surrender to Krishna. Now, how does it work? Srila Prabhupada explains, everyone is engaged in a hard struggle for existence in this world. Because everyone is bound up by this material energy in the form of the three gunas. But this struggle can at once be stopped if we simply surrender to Krishna. How does it work? Since Krishna is the controller of this material energy, he can order the release of those who surrender to him. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada explains, surrender to Krishna is the only way to get free from the clutches of these three gunas in this world. And there is no other way. Next, Krishna describes four kinds of miscreants who never surrender to Krishna. Though they are engaged in very hard struggle for existence, and even though it's very easy to stop this struggle simply by surrendering to Krishna, four kinds of unfortunate people who are miscreants, they never surrender to Krishna. What are these four kinds of people? They are described as those who are grossly foolish, those who are lowest among mankind, those whose knowledge is stolen away by illusion and those who are of the nature of atheistic demons. These four categories of people never surrender to Krishna. They are described as miscreants. 
That means they are always engaged in some activities which are meant for uh, bringing about uh, distress for others. They are always engaged in such uh, miscreant activities. Then there are four kinds of fortunate people who are pious. And such people, particularly four categories of them, these pious people, they surrender to Krishna. How do they surrender? By beginning to render devotional service to Krishna. What are these four kinds of pious people? They are described as those who are distressed and those who are desirers of wealth, those who are inquisitive and those who are searching for knowledge of God. These four kinds of pious people, they surrender to Krishna by beginning to render devotional service to him. Then Krishna describes there are two more categories of less intelligent people. These less intelligent people of two categories. What are the two categories? Those who are worshippers of Devatas and those who are worshippers of the impersonal Brahman. What is impersonal Brahman? There are people who think that ultimately God is formless. God doesn't have any form. And they consider God to be some formless Brahman. This is one description in the Upanishads, in the scriptures, in Vedanta philosophy, that God is Brahman. God is described as Brahman. So, uh, there is one category of less intelligent persons who think that God doesn't have any form and their understanding of God is limited to only considering God to be impersonal or formless Brahman. So what about these two categories of people? Krishna says these two categories of less intelligent persons also do not surrender to Krishna. Just like the four categories of miscreants. These two categories of people also don't surrender to Krishna. The worshippers of Devatas, they, instead of surrendering to Krishna, they surrender to the Devatas. Why? Because they are having some very strong desire for satisfaction of their material demands. And they think it is better to worship the devatas than to worship Krishna. Hmm? So such people, they surrender to the devatas and, the f and they follow very, very nicely the rules for worshipping the devatas. Now this, there are so many devatas. According to the scriptures, there are 33 crore devatas. It's a very, very big number. Actually, these devatas are um, engaged in administration of this universe under the uh, control of Krishna. Ultimately, it is Krishna who is the supreme controller of this entire creation. But Krishna has got these devatas, different grades of devatas, who are all engaged in this universal administration. So, uh, there are these uh, less intelligent worshippers of devatas who surrender to the devatas and Krishna explains that uh, it is Krishna who is seated in everyone's heart. It is he only who makes the faith of these worshippers of devatas is very steady so that the devata worshippers can 
devote themselves to a particular devata for a particular purpose. Now, when they develop this faith for worshipping a particular devata for fulfillment of a particular desire, then by such worship, they may obtain fulfillment of their desire. But Krishna explains something very, very important for us to understand that in actuality, these benefits that seem like the worshippers of the devatas getting from the devatas, actually it is bestowed by Krishna only. How does it work? It is Krishna who is seated on the heart of the worshipper of the devata. It is Krishna who is seated on the heart of the devata himself. So, unless the sanction of Krishna is there, the devata is unable to give any benefit for their worshipper. So therefore, we should always remember that even though it looks like the worshippers of the devatas are getting some benefit by their worship of a particular devata, it is Krishna only who is sanctioning, who is bestowing the benefit. Therefore, Krishna describes these people as less intelligent. They do not know that their benefit is coming from Krishna. That they do not know. Now, what is the result of their worshipping the devatas? Krishna describes that the benefit they get from the devata is limited and temporary. Those who worship the devatas, they go to the planets of the devatas. That is their ultimate achievement. If they continue due to their faith in a particular devata, they continue to worship the devata. Ultimately, the maximum achievement is they can go to the planet of the devatas. Whereas Krishna's devotees who worship Krishna, they ultimately reach Krishna's supreme planet. So there is a difference between the Devata's planets and Krishna's planet. Krishna's planet is outside this material creation. Krishna's planet is indestructible, eternal. The Devata's and their planets are temporary. They are subject to destruction. Just like this whole universe, the whole creation is going to be finally destroyed. At that time, the Devata's planets also will be completely destroyed. The Devata's themselves have to die, including Brahma, the topmost Devata. Everyone has to die, all the Devata's. So, uh, the worship of the Devata's does not give any permanent benefit to the worshipper. Then Krishna also describes the worshippers of the impersonal Brahman, those who don't surrender to Krishna, uh, they are also uh, less intelligent, they are unintelligent. They do not know Krishna perfectly. Why do they worship the impersonal Brahman? Because they do not know Krishna perfectly. And they think that God is formless, therefore they are not able to understand that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. They think that Krishna has come from the formless Brahman or from the impersonal Brahman. Uh, due to their small knowledge, they do not know Krishna's higher nature, which is beyond this formless Brahman. In fact, the Bhagavad Gita Later on, there is an explanation that Krishna is the origin of even the formless Brahman. Krishna is the source of the formless Brahman also, impersonal Brahman also. That these people do not know. And they also do not know Krishna's form is completely spiritual. 
it is not a form like what we have even though krishna appears to take like taking birth as let's say son of vasudeva and devaki when he incarnates as krishna uh, krishna does not actually uh, take a material body like us he comes in his original spiritual form always in all incarnations whenever he appears he comes in his original spiritual form he never changes his form right he is always in his original spiritual form therefore krishna says that he is never visible to the foolish and the less intelligent people because for them he is covered by his internal energy and therefore such less intelligent and foolish people do not know that krishna is never born never takes birth like us and krishna is always infallible infallible means he never uh, falls down from his supreme position he always retains his original supreme uh, position as the supreme lord he remains a supreme lord krishna further describes his supreme position as the supreme lord i know everything that has happened in the past i know everything that is happening in the present i also know everything that is yet to come in the future i know all living beings but me no one knows see krishna's position uh, krishna is the knower of everything past present and future krishna knows every living being his awareness his consciousness is unlimited his consciousness is spread everywhere he has entered into everything that is created as parmatma therefore he knows everything he knows everyone this is unlimited knowledge of krishna so please don't think krishna to be like another devata or to be like some powerful yogi no krishna is this supreme person prabhupad uses one term supreme personality of godhead even among gods he is the godhead he is a supreme he is the chief he is the topmost he is a supreme controller so many descriptions are there in the bhagavad gita and other scriptures then krishna further says all living beings who are taking birth in this world they are born into delusion delusion means completely under illusion completely under illusion that means even though we are in illusion we do not know we are in illusion hmm? and this is due to everyone who takes birth being overcome by the dualities of desire and hate what is the desire and hate everyone is born with some likes and some dislikes everyone so due to these likes and dislikes we are busy with trying to get what we like if we don't have or if we have something which we like we want to keep it with us we don't want to lose it or we want to get rid of that which we don't like we want to avoid whatever we dislike what we don't realize is that we are not this body neither we have got any connection with anything material that we do not understand or realize we do not know due to illusion that i am this not this body i am spirit soul that we do not know that's why krishna uses this word everyone is born into delusion complete illusion total illusion 
but he says particularly about those who have acted piously in previous lives and who are also acting piously in this life perform pious activities and whose sinful actions are completely eradicated such people are freed from this dualities of delusion huh? this duality of hate desire and hate hmm? of likes and dislikes if we become free from it completely then we can become free from all illusion and in that way we can engage ourselves in devotional service to krishna with determination there are so many impediments even for those who want to uh, worship krishna hmm? because the nature of this material existence is such that it always puts a a doubt in the person's mind what is reality what is the truth hmm? so krishna says uh, those who are actually pious truly pious and by virtue of their piety they have become free from all sinful actions they completely stopped sinful activities 100% stopped sinful activities such people are eligible to properly worship krishna with full determination without any influence of the illusory energy this material energy without any influence of the gunas the three gunas sattva guna rajya guna tamo guna and such intelligent persons they ultimately endeavor to become free from uh, old age and death by taking shelter of krishna through devotional service to krishna finally krishna concludes by telling that those who are in full consciousness of krishna he began with i shall now describe to you how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me that means in full krishna consciousness that is exactly bhakti yoga bhakti yoga means to become krishna conscious to become krishna conscious you should know properly scientifically completely who is krishna so he has given this knowledge in this chapter and the advantage of understanding krishna and becoming fully conscious of him especially in three aspects to be conscious of krishna as the supreme lord of this entire material creation as the supreme lord of all the devatas and as the supreme lord of all sacrifices particularly if somebody is aware and fully understands these three aspects of krishna's supreme lordship such a person can understand and know krishna even at the time of death now what is the significance of knowing krishna at time of death that krishna will explain in the next chapter so the next chapter is all about uh knowing krishna at the time of death or remembering krishna at time of death or being cr- conscious of krishna at time of death there's a special significance to that and that will be explained in the next chapter so i'll stop here shrimad bhagavad gita ki jay shri prabhupad ki